All right, I think we will get started. My name is Laura Boley. I'm the facilitator today. And on behalf of Polar Knowledge Canada and Neole, I'd like to welcome you to the Whales and Marine Ecosystems webinar. We are pleased to make this webinar available in three languages, Inuktitut, French, and English. The slide now displayed shows you where the interpretation button is on your Zoom toolbar and how to select the language you wish, you wish to listen in. Um, just a note that when Inuktitut is spoken and you would prefer to hear um, the English, you can switch to English to hear the interpretation. Um, in fact, I just listen in on English, on the English channel all the time myself. Uh, we also have the instructions in chat if you need to look back on them. This webinar is the fifth in a series of webinars that Polar has launched in the month of March. It's called the Knowledge Sharing Webinar Series. I invite you to visit our website for more information on the webinars and other webinars that will be scheduled in the future. Um, just a little plug for tomorrow's webinar. Um, it's on um, Canada and the Antarctic. And you can register for that on Eventbrite if you're interested in joining. Today's webinar highlights key points of a report on whales and marine ecosystems that will be published later this spring as part of Polar's Akaliot. Be sure to check the website uh, and the link is in chat so you can access that and um, watch for the publication. And I recommend that you also go over to Polar's Facebook page and watch there for the announcement and also for recordings of the webinar series. Now, I would like to thank all those who have joined us today for this session. And I'd like to take time to acknowledge that there are people here who are joining us from across the North and Canada. We acknowledge the valuable contributions Indigenous peoples have made and continue to make, both with respect to sharing your lands, resources, skills, and knowledge. We further acknowledge a past that has done great harm and that much needs to be done to bring about true reconciliation. We appreciate that we have an obligation to learn, to listen, to be inclusive and respectful in all of our engagements. Today, we are very grateful for being able to have this knowledge sharing and exchange to help make our work be more inclusive and better as a result of incorporating Indigenous knowledge. And I now invite Elder Timothy to open our meeting with some opening remarks and a prayer. Yes, thank you. I'll say a prayer to open our session. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us a morning to live again, once again on this beautiful earth. May we have a good day and a prosperous year and allow our meeting to go through smoothly. I know sometimes our work can be challenging. However, even at the local level through hamlets may we may you watch over them may you watch over our airlines as they are a vital link to our communities and thank you for the knowledge sharing that occurs each day and particularly during these sessions We pray, Lord, to everyone, no matter where they live in our world. And so we pray for those suffering today, particularly in Lord's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Timothy, for your wise words and for opening the um, all of these uh, knowledge sharing webinars in the past few weeks. I am very grateful. Uh, now I'd like to um, call upon Dr. John Nightingale, who is a board member of Polar Knowledge Canada and former CEO 
and president of OceanWise. Um, Dr. Nightingale is going to greet us with some opening marks, remarks. Over to you. Oh, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Um, I'm delighted to join you. Um, I think these, this webinar series is, is wonderful. It's badly needed. It's exactly what Polar Knowledge should be doing. Um, I'll tell you just a quick little story. Um, I'm a long serving board member. I was actually appointed to the old Polar Commission board by the previous government. And when they recreated uh, the old Polar Commission, uh, they were going to name it something else. They were going to name it after the High Arctic Research Station. And we said, well, that's a thing. This is an organization. You can't, you shouldn't name an organization after a, a physical thing. Um, and we said, besides, the whole mission is knowledge, generation of knowledge, creation of knowledge, sharing of knowledge, utilization of knowledge. And um, it took a little bit of arguing with the PMO, but um, out came uh, the, the name for the organization of, of, as Polar Knowledge. And so it's one of the reasons I'm delighted to be here is that I'm a lifelong advocate for, for open, broad-based community conversation and discussion. And that ranges all the way from uh, just observations of what's going on on the land and in nature and in the communities through scientific data, through all manner of, of traditional knowledge. Um, and so it's all about uh, Polar, I think is the smallest federal agency in the government. I, I say that with not knowing 100% that's true, but we're not very big. Um, and we are science-based and pan, uh, pan Canada, pan Canadian North. And so these five knowledge sharing workshops or webinars are absolutely a, a great start on what Polar can and will do more of in the future. Um, because knowledge doesn't just come from a scientist with an instrument or, um, or a microscope. It comes from uh, all everybody living in the North, from what they see, what they do, and particularly how things have changed are changing, and of course, will change more in the future. So the issues we're discussing are, are complicated and complex, and addressing them can be challenging. So open, broad-based communications like these webinars are absolutely a key. So that the, the knowledge of, of centuries, of generations of living on the land is vital. Um, to put that into the mix of understanding the way things were, the way things are today, in order to be able to predict what's coming in the future. So we're gonna talk about marine mammals and marine ecosystems. Um, and I, I always bug my terrestrial uh, colleagues because there's more water than there is land. Uh, there, there's more marine ecosystems and places for things like marine mammals to live uh, then there is uh, solid land. So it, it's an important topic. And I'm fond of saying, as go our oceans, so goes the land and the rest of us. So it, it is an important topic we're going to talk about today. And I'm delighted to be here and looking very much looking forward to what the panelists have to say. So my support and my appreciation to all of you for participating on behalf of Polar and the board. Thank you. Very much, Dr. Nightingale, um, for your background on polar. Fascinating. And uh, for reinforcing the importance of these knowledge sharing uh, webinars and knowledge sharing in general. So thank you. Now, a bit about the format of today's panel discussion. So today you're going to hear a panel discussion that is based upon um, some what we call thematic questions. And, you, and, and these thematic questions actually formed the basis of the Whales and Marine Ecosystems Report that will be published uh, later this spring in the Akaliat. And you may ask where the thematic questions originated. And they actually originated in um, the Regional Planning and Knowledge Sharing Workshop held at the Canadian High Arctic Research Station in Nunavut in March of 2020. 
um, the report was co uh, collaborated on co developed over the past six or eight months or so um, entirely online. And as this report nears completion, it's actually fitting that we um, come back and revisit these original questions that originated at the workshop, which involved um, community members and researchers, and um, that we revisit these questions with our panelists today, the authors of the report and the Indigenous knowledge holders, community members who contributed to the report. So I'm sure that as you listen in today and you hear some of the questions that are being discussed, um, you will no doubt have more questions yourselves, those of you uh, listening in today. We invite you to um, put your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom. And in just a second, we'll have a slide up here, which will show you where to find that um, Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. So you can just drop it in Q&A, there you go. Just click on the little voice bubble and we will be following along. And if you do actually happen to put your questions in chat, that's okay too, because we are watching. And um, we will try and answer your questions today as best we can. Um, but if not, they all of your questions are being passed along to Polar to be addressed in another format, whether it's another webinar or a blog post or on social media. Before we start, I'd like to invite our panel members and everyone in the audience to do two things. First, I invite you to be comfortable with silence. This today is a discussion more than a presentation. Gaps in conversation will happen. We'll be making space for people to compose their thoughts and contribute. Second, I invite you to be curious. Please make use of that Q&A function and chat with your questions. Okay, so let's get to know our panelists today. I invite all of our panelists to turn their cameras on and please tell us your name and where you are joining us from. And I'm just gonna follow the order on my screen and um, Johnny, you're up first. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to some of you. I'm Johnny Lenny. I'm an Inu value at Harvester. And uh, for some of you who don't know uh, and where the Inu value area is, is we're in the Eastern Beaufort of Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Yola, who do you have with you today? Hi, yeah, thank you, good afternoon. I think it's morning over there. Yes. Uh, I, today I have here with me. I'm with the HTO and I also participate at these uh, sessions. Thank you. My name is Akulukjup. I'm taking part today. I'm from Kimberut. And it's the uh, Mayukhilik hunters and trappers that we're part of. Thank you. And Timothy and Eva, can you please introduce yourselves? My name is Eva Ileitok from Kamanituak, just a recent new member and also new to this session. Thank you. I'm Timothy Iviok. I'm a member of the Hunters and Trappers here, maybe for the past two years already. I'm going to still be on for one more term, one more year. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephen. Yes, good afternoon. And good day, no matter where you are. My name is Stephen Lonsdale. My mother is from Pannaktu. Her name is May Akulukjuk, but I'm here in Ikhaluit. I grew up in Ikhaluit. 
right now, currently I'm with the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board. Shortened acronym is NWMB. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for your welcoming, welcoming thoughts and your welcomeness. Thank you, Stephen. Norman, nice to see you. Can you please just uh, unmute yourself and, and tell us where you are joining from? Oh, you're muted though. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, Norman Mike. I'm from Pannachtu, Norman Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Um, okay, and first up for our author panelists is Bill Halliday. Bill, could you just uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining from. Sure. <clears throat> uh, my name is Bill Halliday. I work for Wildlife Conservation Society Canada, and I'm calling in from Victoria, British Columbia today. Thank you, Bill. And Valeria. Sure. Hi. Uh, I uh, work uh, for Raincoast uh, Conservation Foundation, and I am calling from uh, Vancouver, BC today. Thank you. And Lois. Morning. Good afternoon. Um, great to see everyone and hear your introductions. Uh, my name is Lois. I'm um, a biologist by trade, and I've been living and working in Canada's north in the Western Arctic uh, for uh, well over 30 years. And right now I'm a member of the co-management board in Canada's Western Arctic, which is the Fisheries Joint Management Committee, which we work uh, collaboratively collaboratively with the Inuvialui on um, fish and marine mammal research and monitoring um, activities in Canada's Western Arctic. So thank you. Um, and I just wanna say, I'm very impressed with the uh, all the moving parts that are all moving here this morning and the um, interpretation, it's, it's great. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Uh, Sam, I'm gonna put you on the spot because technically you we're one of the authors and may speak up today. So would you mind just introducing yourself? <laughs> oh, you are putting me on the spot. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Samantha McBeth. I uh, work for Polar Knowledge as uh, one of the policy analysts. Uh, and I'm calling in from Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. Uh, beautiful morning. And I, I do have a background in coastal biology. Um, and I helped write a little bit the sections on certain sections of this paper. So I'll come in, especially from a policy perspective, uh, if need be. Kwana. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so first uh, up this morning, um, we're talking mainly about whale populations and some of the changes that have taken place and how we're monitoring whale populations and uh, um, the, the importance of whales to food security, to communities. But if we could just start off, um, I'd like to ask our Indigenous knowledge holders to tell us about the whale populations in your area and what changes you might have noticed. Um, and if you would like to... Um, you can you can use your your Zoom hand, or you can just unmute and speak up, or just raise your hand, just wave. Norman. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'll speak in Inuktitut. Well, I'm going to share an experience that I know because I'm from Pannachtu and I could share you about uh, two stocks that we see that are beluga whales. They're white belugas, but there's two stocks that we are aware of. We know that uh, one species is from the Hudson Bay stock and they're from there, that beluga whales is from there. 
also our Panoktu Cumberland Sound area, our local species, the local stock is also here. The area we call Nunata in our language, it's, it's on our northern area. We know that there's an um, area for the calving ground. There's also like a breeding area there at the same time. That's one location. I think in the fall to through the winter, even while the ice is trying to form, there's a lot of whales in that area. And the other stock, the Hudson Bay belugas, we also eat that whale, that type of whale, because they're abundant here. But I could tell you our quota is set at 40. The Cumberland Sound, what we call Kangatua Aluk in Inuktitut, we also have a stock, a quota, quota stock of, well, we cannot hunt belugas because of that. Maybe since the 1970s, there was a um, policy set in place, even this is before I was born. But we try to follow the rules. We try to be good stewards of the ocean. So we try to follow the rule. And so, during the summer months, we try to catch our belugas. And, and we know there's a border set there that was set at the time. So we cannot go to that spot to catch any whales from that location because of that policy that was set in the 70s. If we see narwhals, we don't have any quota for narwhals, so we, we're, able, we're able to catch a narwhal even if they're in that particular area because there's no quota set for that species. But we, we know that the stock, they're smaller. And if they're a male, they're a larger, about 20 feet approximately. So they're a very large whale. They come in once in a while, but we do know more frequent whales that come into our Cumberland is the smaller whale. And, and you know that they're, um, the coloring at the end of their um, flipper is a little bit darker black. So we noticed that. Also during the winter months, we also harvest whale because we want to be able to have food security from the whale. There's also whale hunting for bowhead. So we, we're able to have that variety here, but I just wanted to be very brief. We have, a, we have 40 or 43 with our quota and it could be for anyone. In, in our community. That's how we go about hunting. So I don't see our residents, hunters, harvesters going out and catch whatever because they respect the quota system. And that's how I was raised in the time of, uh, the time of having a system set up where we only see quotas. So as long as we're able to sufficiently have enough for everyone, the matak is eaten, the blubber, the skin and the blubber. So we know we know it's available. So I'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if um, Akulujuk and Akigo, do you have whales in your area? You shall have one. Hey, uh, Manele, uh, Kimmerot area. Kimmerot area. We don't see a lot. 
maybe later in the summertime, occasionally somebody will catch a whale. Even during the summer, there isn't a lot. They don't frequent up to Kimirut Bay very much. But back to where we used to have an outpost camp, where we would have our wintering month, where we would winter over in the in that season, I know there was more abundance of whales. And it was further down from Kimmerot. So that's where our outpost camp was, uh, quite a few miles away from Kimmerot. So we know they don't have any area where they have um, breeding ground. There's no breeding ground there. There's no place down there that we know of where they have their, um, where there's anything going on that we just see them. This was an area where my father used to live as a, his outpost camp. We don't have a quota because there's no breeding area there for the whales that are known, but we know in March and April, we know that they're more frequently um, going to the areas where the polynias are, but it's not in great numbers. T cut out there. Yes, I think they froze. Um, I was wondering if, um, Lois or uh, Valeria, um, can you tell us about where different whale populations might be or, or other marine mammals and, and what might be impacting the, um, the whale populations? Were you referring to um, in, the, in the, the speakers? for uh, Pan Your Tongue and Kimmerit or uh, in general? In general, please. Okay. Um, well, there's the, um, it, I'll go ahead with that. Um, based in the Western Arctic, I, I'd say the, the mo most, um, the effects that um, we're seeing, and this is both a combination of scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge and observations as we've been seeing the beluga whales um, generally um, uh, getting thinner or arriving thinner in the spring when they arrive. And, and we've just had a meeting with all our hunters and they all six communities reported seeing this, that the whales were arriving thinner. And then towards the harvesters changed their hunting um, pattern to some of them to harvest later in the season once the whales had regained their condition. So that was, uh, we interviewed each, uh, each harvester and they all had the same messaging. Um, and the other uh, change that they were um, talking about was that the whales were seen in, in different places, like further into um, up river, like up even up towards Fort McPherson and farther near Ulukaktok and um, more often in Husky Lake. So the range was expanding and the hunters were saying that is was an effect of uh, the, the population in that area was, was um, expanding. So thinner whales expanding. And one of our hunters talked about um, an increase in, um, in calf counts and, and a lot of them referred to that. So we, we've, um, and the science, uh, the scientific re records are, are are right in line with this these observations as well. So I'll stop there. Um, in terms of so it sort of shifts in diet and ecosystem, and um, that's making them they're, they're them thinner uh, at first, and then uh, but what but their numbers appear to be expanding. This is with beluga and with bowhead. Um, Valeria, we have a um, Laura. Um, Johnny, Johnny, who is from the same area, oh. had his hand up. So, I oh, sorry, Johnny, hear his comment. Yeah, thank yes, you. Yes, please, Johnny, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd add to Lois's comments, and and yeah, definitely, like um, 
the Eastern Beluga herd is uh, uh, no no trouble in the, with the pop populations we noticed, and it's we we get over a hundred whales a year uh, in our area. Uh, that'll be the Indian Valley settlement region, and and then we've been doing that since uh, ever since I was born, and we had no problem. We have no quotas, and there when I was younger, uh, that was before your time, Lois. There was talk of um, they noticed there was a few a uh, couple summers in a row there was there wasn't much whales, and uh, they started talking about putting on quotas on on air on air on air on our areas, and of course our elders opposed it. And I said it's just a normal thing, and and uh, then a couple of years later, like they came in, came back into the Mackenzie estuary, you know, really strong and lots of whales, and ever since then, like, uh, there's been no talk of quotas in our area, but definitely uh, we we harvest what we exactly what um, Norman and was stating that we harvest what we need, and uh, take just take what we what we need, and we're actually taking less. Than what we done when I was growing up, uh, when I was younger, like we used to easily take 200 whales a year, uh, 30 years ago. But now it's just over 100. Uh, and we got bowheads also, and uh, we I haven't seen any killer whales, but we definitely have a name for them. Uh, so somebody must have seen one sometime. And thank you. Thank you. Uh Donnie, I, I, we are actually going to talk about different, um, any new marine species or whales or um, other marine wildlife that perhaps you're seeing, or people are seeing that they in their area that they never saw before. But I did want to just before that, um, Valeria, I wonder if I could ask you, uh, we have this great infographic that shows some of the, uh, what's impacting uh, the whale populations and other marine wildlife. And I wonder if we share that now, would you be able to speak to that? Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, I, I love this infographic and I don't know if I'll follow it exactly, but uh, I'll just say that, of course, we are all here to talk about, you know, the, the changes that are going on in the Arctic uh, where, Ice is, is an absolutely key element of the ecosystem. It is everything to, to the Arctic. And we know that ice is forming later uh, and, and disappearing sooner. Um, and, uh, and the quality and distribution of, of this ice is, is changing. And so the changes in, in ice have very big consequences uh, for, for species that are ice dependent. Like, uh, uh, you know, and there's some, some species like polar bears or walrus or, or seals that are really ice obligate and some other species that are ice associated like, like belugas. And so uh, sea ice just affects the, the entire uh, food web, uh, basically, which marine mammals, of course, depend on. Uh, it, it affects uh, dissolved, uh, dissolved uh, nutrients and how, how much energy is available to, to be transferred. Um, you know, we have um, I, uh, algae, for example, at the, at the foot of the, of the web um, that are super important uh, in turn to, to zooplankton, um, which in turn feed other species of fish and whales. So Arctic whales, as a result, may be losing uh, their, their preferred prey. Um, for example, for belugas, this is Arctic cod, which is an, uh, associated with sea ice. And we know that belugas, um, are shifting their diet to things like capelin. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. ice also offers uh, protection from, uh, from predators like killer whales, from predators like polar bears. Uh, it offers protection from storms, from, from very extreme weather events, from competing species like parasites and, and organisms that bring diseases. So less ice means much more uh, vulnerable uh, marine mammals. And I'll speak a little bit at, uh, about my area of expertise, which is beluga whale communication and impacts of, of noise. 
Um, I've been studying belugas for, for many, many years, not, not only in the Arctic, belugas are an Arctic species, but they, they move all the way south to the St. Lawrence River estuary. So I, I've been up in the high Arctic, in, also in Hudson Bay, and there's a population that I study in, in the St. Lawrence. And the changes in, in sea ice distribution and, and abundance mean access to human activities, of course, to oil and gas exploration, to ships, um, and this impacts whale populations like beluga whales uh, because it creates opportunities for underwater noise, for more ship strikes, for pollution. If we think about underwater noise in particular, um, it can, you know, what can this do? It can, it can cause animals like belugas or narwhals to leave preferred habitats, uh, to stop feeding sometimes, to, to interrupt nursing activities, and it affects, and we know this from a study we published last year, it affects the communication between mothers and, and calves. It makes it so that moms and calves are not able to hear each other, and this can be very stressful, and I can imagine that it might affect the availability of animals in some areas um, uh, for hunters if, if the animals choose to move away uh, from, those, uh, from those areas. And I think I'll, I think I probably spoke enough. <laughs> Thank you so much, Valeria. Uh, there was a question about the infographic itself um, and whether it will be available. It will be available as part of the report when the report is published in the Akaliat Journal uh, later on in the spring. Unfortunately, we can't share it at this moment, but it is coming your way soon. Um, I wondered if any of our panelists had a question for Valeria about the uh, changes and impact on whale populations or other marine mammals that maybe you noticed in the infographic. Any questions for our authors? Okay, um, so Johnny, you oh, yep, go ahead. Yes, please, please go ahead. Um, I wanted to add, well, as a young person in my teens, I know there was more abundance of whales. When, during the time my father, late father was still alive. And the and, and even during the timeline of 15 years, during the winter months, we didn't really see any problems with regard to the mammals in our region or the whales. And as they are a source of our food, as you know, every part of the animal, the mammal is um, utilized and a lot of times when somebody catches a whale, you'll see a, a group of people rushing in to catch and grab the meat and grab the, the beluga fat and the skin. So they're all grabbing what they can. So that's kind of like become a, um, a pattern. So I can't see the food being wasted I know though that often the guts, the stomach contents are not really collected in some instances or a lot of time, but in some instances they are collected. But I just wanted to share that. I also want to ask if the, my fellow member here would like to add something. And 
for me, somebody commented about the different stocks. So, so the the there are different stocks of of um, whales. I know I could share with you that I'm not a hunter myself, but I have gone on many trips when people go out hunting. So from my own experience, I could share with you that we, we are starting to notice that there are differences and, and there are less to catch. That's, that's all I wanted to be brief about. Thank you. you um so uh the back to the um killer whales johnny it's interesting that you said that um maybe there was one report of a killer whale but you have a name for it um i was wondering um bill could you speak to the the killer whales and maybe then johnny will have a question or i invite questions from anybody and we do have that slide to share, Bill, if you want it. Yeah, sure. You could you could put the slide up while I talk. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'll so um, Johnny, I um, most of my research is is also in, is in the Inuvial settlement region, um, and we have acoustic recorders out, and we're actually listening for whales um, year round. And we we have picked up killer whales once near Saks Harbor. I think it was in 2015. They they seem to have passed passed through, and I think that matched up with um, some sightings that folks from Saks and possibly Ulu, um, Ulu Haktak said that year. Um, but there was an interesting study um, done. It was a traditional knowledge study. They, um, the scientists from Fisheries and Oceans Canada um, went around to the communities in the ISR and, um, and interviewed people, um, interviewed elders about how often they had seen killer whales and it, um, at, at different communities in, in the Amundsen Gulf and, and Eastern Beaufort Sea. And um, it sounded, uh, from my recollection from that study, that there's been a relatively consistent low number of uh, killer whales over the past, um, I can't remember how far back the study went, back into, at least back to 1950, but effectively, people would remember a few sightings every decade, and there's been a, a relatively consistent number in the ISR through that time, at least based on people's um, um, traditional knowledge of um, and, and recollection of, of having seen killer whales. Um, I will say that over in Alaska, and these would be the same, the same population of killer whales that, that people see in the ISR, um, that the killer whale numbers are, seem to be increasing. Killer whales are, are coming up into Alaska and spending more time there. Um, and they're seeing more evidence of, of killer whales attacking bowhead whales and belugas over, over in the, the Chukchi Sea. Um, so there is there is a, a possibility of that increase happening um, in the ISR in the future as um, as there's less and less ice during the summer. Over in Nunavut, they're seeing a very different trend where where there has been a a fairly large increase in killer whale activity um, throughout um, Baffin Bay. Effectively, the waters all around Baffin Island and um, uh, those killer whales are hunt hunting beluga, narwhal, and um, and bowheads, and they're they're even showing um, that the you know the the beluga and and narwhal and bowheads are trying to actively avoid those killer whales because they're they're such a, a big threat to those populations. So different patterns depending on where you are, but uh, but big increases have been happening in in Nunavut especially, uh, and I can I can stop there. Thank you. Uh, actually, Lois has her hand up. Go ahead, Lois. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I just want, are you talking about all um, unusual sightings of species or just focusing on killer whales right now? Because we have uh, a preponderance of other species being recorded lately, uh, although killer whales is not one of them. So I just want to make that comment. Interesting. I just wondered if Johnny had any questions or anybody had any questions for Bill. And then Lois, I'll come right back to you. Um, I just, I got no questions, but uh, just correct you on the, the statement I made. I said, I, I haven't observed any killer whales in my lifetime. And, but we do have a, 
we do have a name for a killer whale in Inuvalok and Avaluk, uh, and it's uh, so someone must have spotted them or knew of them before. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Great, awesome. uh, Timothy and Eva. What was the name in uh, Inuvialuk, dude? Uh, it's pretty well similar to uh, the in Inuit uh, dialect, uh, Achluk. Achluk. Hey, Achluk. And we say Achluk. Yeah. Okay, how are you? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, just. That the name of our killer whale is also Alluk, A R L U K, Alluk. Um, we are starting to see more of them too. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, they they would overkill and just leave what they kill in one bite. So. There's an old pictures where I live, and there's a place called Alunapiminuk. It means where the killer whale harvested, was harvested. And the reason why they killed all the killer whales in my area before was they were seals. Population was very low, and some whales' population were very low, so end up killing all the killer whales. There's even a name for it now, where the harvesting was. And we're, we're starting to see, see more and more and more killer whales in our area um, every year. Uh, Aluk, we call them. And there's similar to Aluk, the same color we call Ticagolik but smaller fins and whatnot that we are starting to see in our area. Uh, and there's plenty of pictures in in Facebook. Some, some people been posting from last summer that they're very friendly, no attacks, no one harvested. We don't, we, we haven't tried them that, that I know of. And, thank you. Thank you, uh, Norman. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Lois, maybe this is in line with what you were thinking, but we have a question from the audience um, about salmon who are moving further east across the Arctic. Um, so among the, um, the, the marine um, wildlife activity changes, are you seeing more salmon? And, and we talked a bit about this last week in the Arctic char webinar. So uh, just there maybe was, just um, Lois. It, yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, there was, uh, it was in 2019, I believe was the year. And there was a flood of salmon of all species, <laughs> all five species. And it was the harvesters from the New Valley communities that we're catching these and sampling and reporting them, and so there was a expect or there was a concern that this would uh, carry on at that level, and the char and the salmon would compete with the uh, char and other subsistence species. So it was a significant um, event, but not but it so it, but it didn't uh, recur the following year. It looked like 2019 was this this huge flood of salmon. And what, I, what I'm saying huge, I'm saying 2,500 salmon were caught by the harvesters in the region when it normally might've been 20. And so it was major, but um, I don't think that we've seen the end of that either. I think it will, another year will come up where at the future, but it so far it hasn't been seen every year. And so 2019, 2020, we've seen harvesters lately reporting um, that uh, seals are less common in nearshore areas, and just just reporting a lot of uh, a lot of changes. And the salmon would be one. Uh, if I could quickly, the, I have a short list here. Is that they, they're seeing we're seeing much more common reports of gray whales, like it, it, 
again, by an order of magnitude. Um, uh, although there's not a lot of uh, research to um, document exactly, but certainly our offshore crews are seeing gray whales where they were quite unusual before. Um, the latest one that I heard about last week, um, I've heard about this from the Eclavic side and from Shingle Point side and from Ulukaktuk side, harbor porpoise. Um, groups of 20 or 30 harbor porpoise is reported in the Western Arctic. And also one of our harvesters too got a harp, uh, harp seal, an identified seal, and it was, it was thought to be a harp seal. So probably a young adult from Nunavut straight over to the Western Arctic. So anyway, the point being um, multiple invasive um, species, they are being tracked. Um, what the, the, what I say, the challenge is that harvesters catch and report and respond and observe very quickly, whereas government or you know the 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 uh, response time to to that to understanding it, and documenting it, and you know processing samples is much slower than indigenous knowledge holders' response time here here with the importance to work together. So um, that was my um, and even last summer there was uh, reports of. Um, black whales and uh, coming into one of the bays and it was described as uh, it was concerned it might have been a pilot whale so I'll stop there so many more questions than answers on the changes in species diversity thank you thank you very much Lois um and um there was a question in the Q&A from Marianne Marcou, who um, was also an author on the report. Um, Marianne, you should be up here. <laughs> uh, nor and, and Marianne wondered, uh, from Norman, um, are the small fin whales you mentioned killer whales? Norman said we call them, um, uh, oh dear. Norman, maybe you can actually come on and tell me <laughs> how to pronounce this properly. But Sam jumped in and said mink whales, that those are mink whales, the small fin whales. So is that is that a new a new species that is moving? The mink whale. Yeah. Norman, did you did you Yeah um, we we call them Tikagulik. They're, they're probably mink whale. Um, there's, there's like in the last meeting with Arctic chars, there's, we are starting to see capelins. We are starting to see herrings and more new species, bigger whales. Um, in the last 10 years, I would say, and we never used to see mink whales or I don't know what you call them here. <laughs> they're too near to us. They're, they're friendly. They're, they're not scared. They're not afraid of boats. They look tasty, but we haven't. We never harvested any of them. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not in our timeline, but but they're eating some of our uh, stuff we eat, the species that we eat, and yeah, we know our looks, our look, and Chicago looks are different. Uh, yeah, thank you. Our look, killer whale, Chicago look, minky whale. <laughs> Um, Timothy, did you uh, wish to say something? Hey, welcome, Timothy. Well, yeah, for me, uh, I look and take out look. Our look is the killer whale and the minky whale. Within the ba uh, Baker Lake waters, <clears throat> I recall though that we saw quite a bit of um, our regular beluga whales. And however, uh, 
we know that sometimes people, the hunters would mistake the killer whales for belugas sometimes. Also the narwhal and the white beluga will be uh, scared off whenever the killer whales come into the Baker Lake region. As you know, it's a big lake and that channel to get it there is narrow. So you'll see them being scared right off because once they see the killer whale, they don't wanna be around them. Also, young people are starting to notice them when they go out, the killer whales and the white bowhead, uh, white beluga whales. So we're starting to notice that change in behavior because that killer whale is the one that's causing it. And as you know, Baker Lake waters, where we are, it's unique. It's not just the killer whales too. We see um, we've seen more white fish. So it seems like they're following the white fish almost, the killer whales. So they're attracted to that fish. And so I'm just using these as examples in some of the little changes that we're noticing, or it could be big changes. And so, as you know, once they're spooked by the uh, killer whales, they're, you know, they're, they're not going to stay. And, and now our younger generation are, are going to live with this experience that we hadn't lived before in the past and the, the type of behavior that there's going to see amongst the different whale species and how they'll hunt is going to have to be uh, shifted to adjust to the changes that are occurring because um, during the summer it's not a long season and so we're going to have to make adjustments in how we go out and to be cautious of um, the invasive species sometimes as you know killer whales are not uh, friendly species, so it's going to have to be a big a shift. Also, you know, they come in during the summer months, and so I just wanted to, to comment on that. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's so Timothy just spoke about um, shifting and making adjustments based on the whale populations and the changes and invasive species. Um, I wondered if our um, Indigenous knowledge holders could talk about how important are whales to your communities in terms of um, food security and livelihoods. So can you tell us a bit about the importance of whales um, to your food security and livelihoods? Okay. Yes, for me, yes. And please, that's from Baker Lake. Please go ahead. Oh. So we're wondering um, about, oh, Norman, Norman has his hand up. Hi, um, can you do English in the album? I'm not the queer chick. Can you look for me? I'm not going to tell you, I keep telling you, 100 years from now, then not. Yeah, no, I'm not 
Tamani Gunishum Luti, Uperta Parainu Luta, Nekigil Lutigu, Pilaluga, Pilaluga to me to Penili, a long honor of Tabu. Take what I think me a cock tail, me you go, Pilaluga, Towning Unuma. On the Tana Nukinga Porsi show a good look to you, Matanga Porsi Runa Pacatigo, Ukimoniatu, Nurinea Tigo, Ma Tana Lunukinga Nicolera show a good look to you. What we have, what we've done is we, we to have food security, we want to ensure that um, from the Hudson Bay stock, we have 40 that we can catch and one boat will catch one whale. And in order to have food security, we want to ensure that we're using up all the meat. We freeze it, we dry the meat, we ensure that they're uh, fresh, ready to eat at any time. And as, as Inuit culture, we want to ensure that these are traditions are passed on. So in order for that to be happening, we have to be practicing the actual hunt. And so we have to utilize, if we're going to catch a larger species, we use a 375 rifle H and H. So those are the kind of rifles we need. One of the things you meant, you asked us if how important is it to our culture that be to be able to have this uh, mammal to sustain our life in order for us to have security, uh, food security. So, what we also try to ensure so we have food security is to also even store the fat. The fat is a delicacy. It's it's a it's something we want to maintain in our culture to continue to use it in our foods. So that's what I wanted to share with you that it's a vital part. It's still very vital, even though here and now in this day, it's still a very vital part. And for our elders, it's still a very important link to their past, but it's also very alive. It's, it's like a living document. It's still very vital part of our life. And so in our waters, all summer, there are different whales and the, the stocks are different. So we still try to continue to hunt them. Thank you so much, I'll end there. Thank you. Um, so um, given the importance of, um, of um, the, the whales to your, uh, to the Northern food security, to your livelihoods, um, what do you think can be done to protect this important um, source for you, this important whale? And I actually would like to invite our indigenous knowledge holders to speak first, and then afterwards um, the authors to talk about some of what's what's happening. Stephen. Mm. Um, thank you. Um, I have to get going soon, so I wanted to weigh in at, at least on on one discussion before I left. And so I think. Um, what, what needs to be done is kind of that the, we need more talks like this. This is a forum that I'm very new to 
but am very, very impressed as to how things, uh, how the dialogue is, is going. And, and so I think something like this really helps, but I'm, I'm reminded of um, this elder group that I was working with and a comment made by one of them saying that the whales go, the whales come up here because it's quiet. And so this is knowledge going back millennia. And it's only in recent times that it hasn't become quiet with shipping and other activities. And so a lot of these discussions we were having with the elder group, we were trying to talk about mitigation measures towards the shipping or towards other activities that, you know, cre that create the noise, but we were having a, a very hard time moving the discussion forward because we already went one step too far from what they were comfortable with. Um, so the discussion needs to occur before the mitigation. So it's almost like don't talk about the problem or how to solve the problem until you, you know, like you're minimizing the impacts of a problem when you should be talking about the bigger issue of, of, of shipping itself, of maybe corridors, of seasonal restrictions and things like that. It's almost like don't do it after the fact. So I think that's one thing that, that really sticks in my mind is that that observation of they come up here because it's quiet. So how do we respect the original environment that was there or that is there uh, before we get into these larger scale discussions about mitigation measures? So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if one of our authors would like to respond to Stephen. I'd be happy to jump in there. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. So um, just a bit of background. My, my research is all about underwater noise from ships and how it impacts Arctic species, whales, seals. Um, and we've got a project right now on the go with mitigation measures and modeling anyways, not actually real mitigation measures in the water, but, but looking at, at the effectiveness of those. And I think that, um, you know, that idea that the whales come to the Arctic because it's quiet. The whales have been in the Arctic for millennia and are used to this quiet environment. And they're seeing some pretty rapid changes about how noisy it is. Where, you know, beluga whales have been shown to react to ship noise from greater than 50 kilometers away. And, and that's just a huge distance that's unheard of for other species. And, and one of the reasons that belugas can react that far away is because the Arctic is so quiet. They're so used to nothing. And then when a loud ship comes through, they can, they can really, um, you know, it startles them. They show a anti-predator response and they leave an area. And so working towards quieting these, um, you know, industrial activities and shipping in the Arctic is, is I think if you, want the whales to continue doing what they were doing before the shipping happened, then it's um, you know, doing things like making corridors that avoid sensitive areas and um, having quieter ships in general, um, or maybe even less ships if that was a possibility um, are the way to go. But um, lots of work needs to happen both on the local scale at individual communities, figuring out what sort of mitigation measures are, are good for that community and what, um, and then um, actually getting the government to uptake those suggestions and, um, and try to actually make a change about where ships are allowed to go. Um, there's, there's a lot of work that, um, that needs to be done. And I just wanna draw quickly on, on an on effort that's being done in the Inuvialuit settlement region. Um, and that's they've, um, the co-management boards work together with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and others to come up with uh, what's called a notice to mariners right now. And it's a voluntary measure that's sent around to all ships. And it, it effectively, it's a big map and it shows here are the important areas that the Nuvialut have identified for belugas and bowheads. And here are their recommendations for ships, all ships coming through. And that's to avoid the, the marine protected areas that the communities have set aside as, as important areas for species like beluga. And then to 
for ships to be traveling slow in all of these other important areas that are outside the marine protected area so that those slow ships aren't quite as loud as if they were traveling fast. And I think that that's just, it's a really good model that's, um, that's worked and, and now we need to actually track whether or not the ships are, are following this voluntary measure. Um, but it's, it, it was just really nice to see the co-management boards working closely with the government to come up with this, this option. And, and I, I'd love to see something like that mirrored throughout Nunavut as well. And I can, I can pause there. Uh, Stephen has his hand up. Mm -hmm. uh, last one before I go. <laughs> um, I, I'd say uh, creating Inuit standards in uh, research, uh, environmental assessment, in you know things like mitigation, um, because we do ha carry a, I think a lower threshold for um, interaction and impact within the animals and, and the environment. And one good example is um, uh, a hunter in Resolute told me a story of where, you know, beluga hunting where they, you know, the belugas will pass through going somewhere. And then in his, at his hunting spot, he'll wait at, as they, as they pass through. And so someone um, uh, I think was in, shipping or mining or something had said had referenced a study saying that belugas will um, be affected in their migration by uh, shipping noise but then will return to their original kind of trajectory uh, after a couple days you know they will adjust and so it was justifying the shipping noise saying it's not that great so it's okay and then the hunter had replied saying that, well, two days is, is sometimes my window for that hunt because they pass through this area and that, yeah, they might return to their migration route, but that affects me. It's like, so they are pushed off their original path uh, and really bypass could bypass his hunting spot so that two day recovery is not sufficient for certain hunters. Thank you. And Johnny, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for them and comments, sir. And uh, I just wanna respond to a couple uh, issues that was brought up, uh, mainly uh, industry and shipping, how they affect uh, beluga whales and whaling and harvesting. Uh, I'd just like to mention like in the eastern Beaufort, like there's been over 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 60 wells drilled in the offshore, uh, done hundreds of kilometers of um, offshore seismic. And like that, that all happened while I was growing up and we we're hunting consistently. And it yeah, they, they change a little they might have changed. It does affect them, but we still they came came into their shallow waters, their their calving grounds, and we did we we continued our harvesting, and might have been affected a little bit. But as far as uh, like large scale um, effect on them, I'm I'm not sure. I have my doubts. But what what I don't hear is like like for example, we don't have a quota system. The Eastern Beluga herd. It's probably the only herd that wasn't commercially harvested. And so the population is sustaining for our use. And like we're, we're sustain, you know, we've been taking a couple hundred whales for since time immemorial. And like, I haven't heard any reports on how have the Eastern beluga pods, have they recovered from the whaling era? Uh, just for example, I'd done some research when I was going to school. Just uh, one hunt in the Frobisher Bay, that's what they called it back then in the uh, eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. They, they killed 30,000 beluga. Um, like, are they recovered? Like, I don't hear none of that. And they're, they're now everybody's saying this is happening and that's happening. 
um, you know, it's it's all re recorded. Like I, I done that them studies back before there was internet and you had to look at everything by the books. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of it's available and and it does, yeah, it does. It's detrimental to the Inuit and ourselves because now in the Eastern Arctic, everybody's still on quota systems. They only could hunt so much. They can't hunt as much as they want to. Whereas we have the option. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, Norman, I did see your hand. I wanted to give our researchers a chance to respond to Johnny about the beluga populations, if you have any information. Uh, Lois, did you did you want to, or that was on something else? Um, actually, it was was on something else. So um, uh, I can respond on beluga or the other thing, whatever, or we can just wait. If the beluga at first, if you okay. could. Yep. On the beluga stock, well, just as Johnny said, yes, they the um, the stocks that were available in the 70s during the during all the oil and gas activity are still being harvested and are still coming back and they're still doing their doing kind of the same thing. In fact, as I was saying, I think the impacts now are more related to climate shifts and diet shifts as opposed to and potentially shipping. But as Bill talked about, they have a, a mitigation measure for that. But uh, I think uh, so. Jo what Johnny's saying is uh, absolutely uh, correct. It was uh, obviously it was not a the stock is not depleted in the Western Arctic. Um, I keyed in on a comment that the um, uh, Stephen uh, Lonsdale made that I hadn't heard before, and I really uh, liked the the wording. It was the Inuit um, standards and thresholds. That's not a term I've heard before, and I think it's. It, it nails it. I think that's a great, um, the, so that's, I hope that is captured in your meeting record. I'm sure it would be that. What, uh, what science or what government more likely would accept as a threshold of displacing a whale or, or you know, what, a, what that, you know, a, a response would not be necessarily be acceptable to Inuit. So I think that's a really strong, strong point. And uh, my, um, my overarching, anyway, I'll stop there. I do have one overarching comment, but I'll stop it. I'll save that if there's time later. Thank you. Thanks, and Sam. Just a, a quick mention of, of measures that can be used to, to uh, steward, offer stewardship and, and manage and, and protect these different populations. Um, quotas gets, get, gets mentioned a lot, but like Johnny said, uh, they're not necessarily needed um, in the Western Arctic. So there's so many different kinds of tools that can be used locally to protect waters, to protect marine areas. Um, and there's no one size fits all. I know federally um, or even internationally, we hear a lot about marine protected areas and those kinds of conservation measures. But a um, uh, a protection measure is only as good as how it's used locally, right? And communities have a lot of power in deciding what can be done with their waters. Just a question of knowing which tools to use. Um, there's been a lot of talk in marine protected areas. I'm thinking around pond, for example, and the creation of, of the Lancaster Sound area, but that might not work everywhere. And working directly with local impacts, you know, working with shipping instead of working with protection measures or working with exploration or working with even like dredging, right? Dredging, dredging channels all the way to communities to allow shipping. All those aspects can imp implicate and involve understanding how marine mammals are impacted. And I, I invite, you know, once our report is, is published to take a look at, because we did focus on, on, on some of the different tools that each and, each and every community can look into um, to talk about how they can manage for themselves their waters. So not, there's no one size fits all. Thank you, Sam. Um, we are going to be ending our webinar very shortly.
So I wanted to invite our Indigenous knowledge holders for any last comments you might have. Um, goodness, we covered so much in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> so, um, but especially what, what um, Sam was just speaking about with, with community uh, involvement. Yes, Timothy. Uh, Oh, thank you. It's me, Eva. Hi, Eva. Just a question. And just wondering when, when research is happening, I'm curious, do you, how much involvement is there with the community, the Inuit communities, when you do your research? How, in, how involved are the Inuit, specifically Inuit? And that's my question to the researchers. How much Inuit traditional knowledge is involved? Thank you. I open the floor. All right, I can jump in quick. Um, we work um, our, at our research. We um, effectively always have um, some Inuvialuit folks in the field with us because um, our, our work is over in the Inuvialuit settlement region. Um, and we are not explicitly collecting um, Inuit knowledge, um, but we, we are certainly having lots of conversations about the research and listening, and we, we present our results to the Inuvial Game Council and the Fisheries Joint Management Committee. And um, when, when they have uh, points about, you know, particular things that we should pay attention to because that is known from, from their knowledge, then we, we definitely take, um, uh, a careful listen to it and, and try to adapt our research uh, in response to it. Thank you, uh, Bill. Oh my goodness. Um, Nigula, do you, who do you have who would like to speak? And so my question is her about the killer whales. <laughs> Somebody was talking about killer whales. Are we gonna break any rules if we set in our community in order to um, kill off any killer whales? Are we able to do that at the local level if we perceive them to be a threat to our own um, to our own um, species that we need to have for food security. So that's that's what I'm wondering about. So we do we we have heard about killer whales for a, a long time. Like we're looking at thousands of years. And so, but it's interesting that the movement of the killer whales, their patterns have changed. But it's a it's a normal knowledge that's passed on. But my question was, can we just call them if they're a, a nuisance? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, can one of our researchers jump in, or anybody else? <laughs> um, um, I um, don't know the answer to that. I I worked with science, e, not with the, uh, but I can find out. I will find out and, and let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Louis, you. you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Norman wants to respond to the question. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, okay, Norman and then Timothy and Eva. Yes, for the question that was posed by the lady in Kimmerut. So the location where we caught and called killer whale, it was in the 1970s. And 
there was a calling of the killer whales in the Cumberland Sound back then in the 1970s. And, and so it was because we were finding the stocks that we catch were being overkilled by the killer whales. So we decided to do that ourselves. I think if we did a count in our belugas within the Cumberland Sound, once the ice mo once the ice moves out and there's no more ice when the breakup occurs the one in the further north the we know that Iqaluit normally um, has a later breakup but we have an earlier one if we were to count all the uh, belugas So one of the concerns we have is that often we're lumped in as a group with Frobisher Bay. And so Cumberland Town and Frobisher Bay are always lumped in with the research that occurs. So there are these little nuances in how research is done. So the biologists tend to group everyone or the group, the two regions. And so the quotas are set up accordingly even though geographically they're in different locations and you have a group, a community of harvesters from one area. And then there's always a struggle and DFO sets the policies and the restrictions in place with the quotas. So these are issues that are ongoing. And so there's continual research that happens. And so Joe comes back, he's one of the researchers, a biologist, but lately he hasn't returned and uh, I think he passed away, but there hasn't been any news about anyone else replacing that person. And I know in the Clearwater area, there was usually a count of all the belugas. And because it's an area where it's um, a unique place where birthing occurs. So I just wanted to respond a little bit about although it's it's very loaded in terms of the question that was posed but there's a lot of issues as to how inuit can take action and should take action thank you i'll end there thank you norman and uh timothy or eva hey uh well timothy uh Anna. yes timothy here Something I've been thinking about when it comes to the species out there in our oceans, when we think about the belugas, and sometimes there's occasional narwhals, and I think they're killed off by killer whales. So we sometimes see them, you know, they're dead and they're out there and I don't know where they come from, but they're obviously the killer whales are, are um, there. One of the things I thought about too was that when we talked about the shipping routes and so I don't know what the best answer is in terms of um, protection of our mammals, but you know that we have barges coming up Baker Lake because they're bringing in the resupply of our fuel and other, our other materials and supplies. And so that's a vital part of our uh, resupply season. But it's also a time when we see more frequent boaters and the more frequent uh, species that are coming in that time of the year. And there's an abundance once they come in, it's just, it falls at the right time when the belugas and the seals and sometimes an occasional walrus decided. It's just around the time when the resupply season is bringing up all our resupplies then you'll see an abundance of all these species coming in up to Baker Lake. So as for researches, 
and they it, it, it would be nice to have that research taking place also in our area i just wanted to comment on that point i'll end there thank you um thank thank you uh timothy and i just wanted to read out we had a response from uh marianne marku who uh is in the audience uh in it's an answer about um, culling the killer whales. And she said, in order to cull the killer whales, you would have to work with your regional wildlife board, none of it wildlife management board and the fisheries management group at fisheries and oceans. So there's so many complex issues. This is a wonderful conversation. And uh, I think we will need to continue this on another date. We need to uh, close now. Um, I want to thank everybody and I would like to invite, oh, Norman, are you, would you like to say something or are you waving goodbye? Okay, all right, <laughs> here, bye. Okay. Stay there for a second. Right. <laughs> I'd like to invite um, um, Akulujak or Akigo to give us some closing remarks and a closing prayer. Okay, we're going to close off by saying a nice little prayer in order to rejuvenate our spirit. And, and dear Lord, our Jesus, I pray to you right now that you will be able to help us through our day and that you've always helped us in our daily lives. And you have helped us today immensely by allowing engagement to take place. And when we look at the world and what the problems are there and we try to solve these problems, you give us guidance. So in the future, you will guide us once again. And you have helped us today by allowing us to talk openly, allowing an interpreter to be handy, allowing our, our the panelists to be available, to listen to our concerns. And I thank you. And thank you for everyone that participated. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. And that brings our uh, Wales webinar to a close. This event has been recorded and the uh, videos will be posted to YouTube, uh, to Polar's YouTube channel. So please watch the Polar website and also um, Polar's various social media channels um, for information about when these videos are going to be posted and about future webinars as well. So thank you again for attending today. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our Indigenous knowledge holders who are joining us today for the last time. But I hope that this is the beginning of our conversations together and not the end. So thank you so much. Um, a special thank you to our interpreters who allowed us to um, speak with each other. And um, thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you later. Thank you.